Good afternoon, welcome to Educet Network. Friend, as you know, this week we have organized a lecture on Mauryan history, but uh, we covered in the last four lectures rise of Magadha, Mauryan period, and post Mauryan period, so cover most of the things. So to, uh, that's why today's lecture is slightly on different topic, uh, that is Indian national movement and cinema. We'll try to understand how the inter Indian national movement cinema was interlinked, the influence uh, of national movement on cinema, also cinema influence on uh, Indian national movement. So we'll try to ex uh, know the different facet of it. And for discussion on this very topic, we have new studio, Professor Manoj Sarma, he teaches history in Kirolimar College, New Delhi. And uh, his area uh, of uh, specialization is uh, modern history and media. So I think his knowledge and experience will certainly help us to understand uh, national movement and cinema. And uh, uh, the, uh, Professor Sarma has also contributed topics in uh, uh, different uh, uh, scholarly journals. So I think his uh, knowledge and uh, area on, of uh, interest of this issue, cinema and national movement uh, is going to help us. So on your behalf, I welcome Dr. Sarma for the Educet Lecture. Welcome, sir. Thank you, sir. Today, friends, we will talk about the Indian national movement and cinema, that how during the Indian national movement, cinema was able to influence some of the facets of the Indian national movement and how Indian national movement, it influenced cinema. As we can very well see, the first organized protest against the colonial rule could be seen in the form of the revolt of 1857. The revolt of 1857 was the first organized attempt to throw off the colonial rule. After that, we can see the formation of the Indian National Congress in 1885. In, the, in terms of background, we can very well see that during the moderate phase of the Indian National Congress from 1885 to 1905, that is called the moderate, the phase of the moderate politics, in which the moderate leaders, they, they were petitioning, they were praying and they were protesting. So three Ps, petition, prayer and protest, they, they were the main work during the moderate phase. After that, we can very well see that the Sudeshi movement, Swadeshi movement in which Swadeshi and boycott that, that was the watchword during that time and there was a lot of emphasis on uh, using the Swadeshi goods and facilities. Then we have the phase of the extremist Lal Bal Pal, they were the three important leaders of the extremist phase of the Indian national movement. After that we have some of the phase in which uh, the revolutionaries they played an important role and some of they, they relied on individual heroics and they also indulged in some of the activities so that they could terrorize the British in that sense. After that we see the phase of uh, Gandhi, that is the Gandhian phase in which Gandhi emerges as a leader. The three movements in Champaran, then Kheda and Ahmedabad mill strike in India when Gandhi comes in 1915. And after that, he is able to establish himself as a leader through these three smaller movements in different parts of the country. After that, in the anti rowlet Act protest, Gandhi is able to emerge as an All India leader because of which he has a good following. The Khilafat movement started by Gandhi leads to the non-cooperation movement in which Gandhi himself plays an important role till it is called off by the Chauri Chaura incident in 1922. In 1930, the Dandi March in the form of non-cooperation movement was another important highlight of Gandhi's career. In 1942, the Quit India movement in which Gandhi gave the call of do or die was another important stage in the history of Indian national movement. So this was some, some kind of a small background in which we will try to see how cinema played an important role or how the activities of the Indian national movement, they played an important role in influencing cinema. If we see national movement, we can very well say that it was the result of some fundamental contradiction between the interests of the Indian people and that of the British colonialism. The national leaders, they evolved a clear-cut anti-colonial ideology on which they based the national movement. It played a pivotal role by which Indian people got formed into a nation. 
and the objective and the function of the movement was to promote growing unity of the Indian people through a common struggle against colonialism. So, these were some of the important features of the movement and these were some of the important ideals of the people those who were associated with the movement. In that background, we see that Indian cinema or uh, the uniqueness of the Hindi or Indian cinema, it lied in the fact that it grew and developed during the most active phase of the Indian freedom struggle. And it was very natural that it was influenced by the ideals and objectives of the Indian national movement. It could be suggested that while interacting with socio-political realities of that period, Hindi cinema or Indian cinema was influencing as well as being influenced by it. We see that the talkie, the before the coming of the talkies in 1931, we have a phase in which we have the films which were made in the silent era. All these films, they were mute, they were silent in nature. And before that, when the first silent film Raja Harishchandra, which was made in 1913, we have a phase in which we have the topicals. Topicals were the small films which were shot on the location. For example, when cinema came to the world in 1895, we can very well say that cinema was a very important audio visual invention of the 20th century and its influence was all pervading that we can we, we very well see in different spheres in fashion in taste even very even now you can very well see that how cinema influences different generations or different aspects of the economy society culture etc so in the 20th century Cinema played a definite role in shaping the momentum of the development of the entire society. And in the history writing of the 20th century, to overlook the films made during this period would be to ignore an essential acting force of history. The sphere of art, literature, culture is as important as the sphere of political institutions. As we can see that cinema which emerged in it, it uh, grew during the 20th century, though it emerged in the later half of the 19th century. And it could influence the so society, polity, economy and culture at varying times at different periods. We can see, we can say that the message of the film is not only contained in the dialogues. The dialogues alone do not convey the message which is being conveyed by the filmmakers. But the symbols which are part of a particular cultural context, of a particular social context, they also play an important role in communication of an idea. And most often these uh, symbols, they are or signs, they are part and parcel of a certain social and historical context and they are able to generate an emotion or they are able to extract an emotion and excite a large number of masses at the same time. These symbols, they play an important role in creating appropriate emotional response or climate among the audience. Because cinema, in cinema, we do not have only dialogues, but at the same time, the various cultural symbols or the signs, they also play an important role and they are all specifically located in some kind of a social and cultural context. And that is why they are understandable to a particular kind of audience in which the film is being made. Uh, we can say the first commercial, successful commercial exhibition of cinema was made by Lumiere brothers, Louis and August Lumiere on 28 December 1895 at the Grand Cafe in Boulevard des Capuchines, which was located in Paris in a basement hall which was named oddly enough Salon des Indes, the Indian Salon. Within a year, the representatives of Lumiere Brothers, they organized cinema shows in important cities of the world and they also sold some of the cinematographic equipment so that people from across the world, they can uh, participate themselves and play an important role in making certain films. Their Expeditions were successful in their goal of creating the worldwide market for their films and equipment. And that we can see, say, uh, we can see in case of India as well, that some of the early pioneers, they were being influenced by watching the small films or the topicals which were made by the Lumiere brothers and which were shown in India in 1896 in the Kala Ghoda area. On Tuesday 7th, 1896, in Bombay's Watson Hotel, which was located in the Kalaghoda area, was organized the first public exhibition of cinema in India. 
After this public exhibition of Lumiere brothers, some enthusiastic Indians, they purchased the cinematographic equipments and these cinematographic equipments, they were being used so that they can also make certain films in India. And some of the early pioneers of this field were Harish Chandra Sakharam Bhattavatekar or Save Dada, Hiralal Sen, R.G. Tornay and finally Dada Sahab Falke or D.G. Falke who made Raja Harish Chandra in 1913, which is considered to be the first indigenous feature film of India. Though in 1912, another film by the name of Pundalik, which was made in 1912, but in terms of feature film, Dada Sahab Falke is made the first film which is called Raja Harish Chand and it is considered to be the first feature film of India. In that initial phase before the coming of uh, Raja Harish Chand, some of the topicals which were made by different people, in these topicals some of the ceremonies of, uh, for example, one film was made in which a doctor f came from abroad. So, the arrival of Dr. Paranjpe, so that was being shot. So, these were some of the small films which were being made and cinema was considered to be the marvel of the century, Times of India which published uh, the news next day when cinema was first exhibited in India. It said it is a marvel of the century and later it turned out to be that it was really a marvel of the century. So, during the silent era, we see that films of different genres they were being made from 1913 when the uh, uh, Raja Harish Chandra or the first silent film was made till 1931 when Alamara which was the first Indian talkie made by Ardeshir Irani was made. You have in a number of films which were made in India and these films though they were silent in nature it does not mean that they were, they, there was no accompaniment in these films as we can very well see that below the screen some of the musicians they set uh, and they performed live. They were able to narrate some of the stories, they played music and this is how they were able to entertain the audience during that time. At the same time we can very well say that cinema was more or less strengthening its roots in the whole world in the same era at the same time because during that time when films were being made in America or in Europe. At the same time films they were being made in India as well. One of the important journalists K. Abbas who's, who was also a film critic and a film scholar and he also made and a good filmmaker as well who made certain films. He said that great, great cinema like all great art must serve the spiritual needs of the people, express their unexpected thoughts and emotions, their joys and sorrows, their urges and aspirations. It must make the people laugh and cry, it must occasionally make them think, it must, it must stimulate their imagination, make them indignant against social injustices, must help them to understand life and its complexities, it must help men to understand themselves. So, Abbas makes a very careful observation because when we are seeing cinema, when we are watching films, then, then we go through a number of emotions. Even now when we see films, we go through during that two and a half hours, maybe three hours, we go through so many emotions that these emotions maybe are in terms of our aspirations, these emotions may be in terms of our repressed feelings, maybe our joys and sorrows and we are sometimes we are able to identify with the characters in the films as well. So, these films they make us think as well that what all is happening in the society and if at all if that is wrong or right what kind of corrective measures can be taken. Initially what we see that in the various genres of films which were being made, mythological films they were the first which were to be made and it was a very safe starting point as the films as the themes of the films they were very familiar to the audience and their mythological and religious character, it appealed to the audience. These films they dealt with the characters and events which were taken from the distant past and which were often inscribed in epics and the scriptures and they portray interaction between deities, demons and supernatural powers. So, what we see is that initially most of the films they were based on the mythological themes, themes taken from Ramayana, themes taken from Mahabharata or some other Puranas or epics. An audience could also relate with them in the sense that audience, th there were no dialogues 
and these stories they were known to the audience in advance. So, it was comparatively easier to relate with them. At the same time, these films they also present some kind of interface between the past and the present. The very fact that the presentation of these stories of past is in a modern and new technological medium like cinema suggests this kind of thing. And when these gods and these goddesses they appeared on the screen in flesh and blood from the cold pages of the scriptures and the epics and they performed miracles. The illiterate spectators they actually prostrated themselves taking these screen gods as real. They thought that these screen gods they were real even now even uh, I think in late 80s early 90s when Ramayana and Mahabharata these serials they were being transmitted on national television. We see that the actors and actresses those who were performing the parts of the various uh, religious deities they got a such kind of response from the masses that they considered that masses considered them that they were actually the gods and goddesses. So, we can very well imagine when this kind of thing was happening in 1980s what would have happened during 1920s that time uh, when people the kind of literacy levels were very low then people they were very uh, some kind of uh, these kind of notions that when they saw gods and goddesses and they, they, their aspirations and their desires they will be fulfilled. So, these kind of notions they were there apart from mythologicals a number of devotional films they were also being made during that time. And these uh, devotional films they were based on the saints and the devo devotees like Tulsidas, Surdas, Tukaram which were there in different parts of the country. And these holy men and women they were endowed with the power to perform miracles. But their lives and teachings had a profound influence on the masses and they, they were held in great reverence. That we can very well say in one of the films which were made in 1936, uh, Santutukaram which, which was made by Fateh Lal and Damle and this film became very very popular during that time. And as I have already told you that how the serial actors in uh, Mahabharata and Rama and how they were being recognized by the masses or how they were venerated or given respect by the masses. In some of the films they became very important uh, commercial hits like Lanka Dehen, Shri Krishna Jan, Kaliya Mardan, Sati Ansuya, Rama and etc., which were made at different times. And we have some kind of a statistic also that around 15 percent of the films uh, were mythologicals during 1923 to 1930. So, this was the kind of percentage uh, uh, the total films which were being made around 15 percent they were the mythologicals. Of the 1268 silent films which were produced from 1913 to 1934 about 20 percent were mythologicals. And from 1931 to 1934 more than 40 percent of the films they were based on the mythological subjects. So, you have a huge chunk of films which were based on the mythological themes. Uh, there were a number of factors which were apart from the fact that the stories they were known to the masses during that time there were other factors which were responsible for such kind of themes which were presented on the screen. For example, we, we say that the mythologicals they sustained the positive response and in the sense that the conditions which were created during the long period of subjugation during the colonial rule. So, the mythologicals they presented things in a much more positive light in which uh, the lead character or maybe god or goddess or uh, uh, the saint he was able to transform the world with his miracles. So, the people or the masses they had this kind of feeling that their lives can also be corrected their, their aspirations their desires they will be fulfilled if uh, uh, some kind of miracles they happen in their lives. At the same time through the centuries of ignorance and the illiteracy, poverty and superstitions the teachings of the saints and the devo devotees made the people fatalistic. People they believed that uh, because of such kind of factors which were prevailing in country at that time people they became more fatalistic in nature they believed that whatever is going to happen will happen. So, this kind of uh, belief in the fate it was also there at that time. And it this kind of influence what was there in different individuals and the community and the country that can be seen. 
We can also very well say that this strong undercurrent of common religious belief was a major unifying factor during that time. Not only in the film, but other performing arts, they were also conditioned by these circumstances. Whether it was a stage play, a jatra, a notanki, tamasha or kirtan. The different tales from Ramayana, Mahabharat and Puranas, they always dominated the screen. We can also very well say that the film audience in India at that time has exhibited an infatuation with myth, with devout worship of gods and goddesses, faith in divinity for performing miracles and the eternal craving for magical solutions of the problems of the life. We can also point out that an important factor for such kind of films being made, mythologicals and devotional was the strict censorship norms for the films of the socio-political nature by the imperialist government. The imperialist government, the kind of films which were being permitted by the imperialist government, they should not have any kind of political overtones because these kind of overtones might affect the colonial government in a negative way. So, they were not in any way censoring the films which were mythological or devotional in nature. And at the same time, the fear of the loss of capital among the producers, it discouraged them to depart from mythologicals and venture into other themes. The the, uh, the producers, because filmmaking itself is a costly affair, a, a lot of money is being involved. So, the producers, those who were making these films, they had a fear that if they will make uh, uh, political films, if they will make films which are not being liked by the colonial government or the colonial censorship authority. So, that way they wanted some kind of safer films which were not being censored because they wanted to recover their money as well. So, that is why mythologicals and devotionals they were being preferred. Dr. Sarvapalli Radhakrishnan, who also became Vice President of India, he said that the mythological themes appealed more to people in view of the inherent traditions of religion and devotion in the mind of an average Indian. The mythological pictures, therefore, in whatever language they might be or may be, have a wider appeal as the relevant incidents are recognized and appreciated by masses all across India. The people they are able to relate with those kind of things and that is why they have a wider acceptance among the masses as suggested by Dr. Radhakrishnan. At the same time, we can very well say that it is not the offerings and the prayers of the devotees in a mythological picture that impresses the Indian audience or the masses. The applause only comes when the God brings back dead to life or rescues their de devotees from their pitiable lot. So, we can very well say that when some kind of miracles they happen, then only the kind of cheer which is there it is generated. Otherwise, these kind of cheers are not generated only by when these kind of gods or goddesses they come. So, these miracles, they have an important role to play in the uh, popular imagination of the masses. Then we can say the popularity of the mythological was also due to the fact or the kind of undercurrents they were also there uh, in these films that there was some kind of growing national consciousness in the cinema of uh, uh, mythologicals and the devotionals. And these popular legends of the gods and goddesses, they were familiar to the commonest and the poorest Indians and they provided an oblique affirmation of the national sentiments against the threatened domination of an alien, alien culture. So, we can say that when Indians, they were seeing such kind of films, they were able to relate with their culture and at the same time, they had this kind of belief in their culture that any kind of alien culture will not be able to dominate them. So, they were showing some kind of solidarity with their own culture during this time. At the same time, we can very well say that the mythological films during this period, they exhibited the ideals and values which were needed for social regeneration. If we see uh, Raja Harishchand, uh, which was made in 1930 and later also uh, the, the story of Raja Harishchand was made 
by different people. For example, it was made Ayodhya Karaja in 1932 and at different times the story of Raja Harishchand was presented by different uh, film theoreticians, filmmakers, those who saw it. And we can very well say that how the Raja Harishchand, he can be seen uh, as some sort of a parallel to the philosophy of Satyagraha because during that time uh, the Gandhian philosophy of Satyagraha, non-violence, ahimsa and relying on truth they became very important during the phase of the Indian national movement. And Gandhi's argument that we had to suffer uh, with faith in the ultimate victory of good over evil, that we will be able to survive, we will, uh, the uh, victory of good will take place over evil, but we have to be patient with us, we have to follow uh, truth and ahinsa. So, the Satyagraha of Raja Harishchandra could be seen in terms of the Satyagraha which was led by Gandhi for the people during this time. And for the success of this Satyagraha, it was very important that self-sacrifice by the Indians that should be done. And this self-sacrifice should be selfless in nature. The colonial masters, they will be brute in nature, but at the same time Indians, they had to be patient so that they can carry on their struggle against these masters. And that is why unsurprisingly the story of Raja Harishchandra was filmed in many languages at different film making centers at several times. We can also point out that in the general atmosphere of growing anti-imperialism, even mythological legends, they were interpreted or they were being seen as symbolic representations of the struggle against tyranny. For example, we see that Lord Krishna's struggle against the tyrant Kans, who is his maternal uncle. Whenever it was projected on a screen, it could strike a patriotic note of defiance in the heart of the film goers. The people those who went to see the films, they could draw some kind of parallels between the struggle of Lord Krishna against Kans, who was seen as some kind of evil authority, who had usurped the throne of uh, which was legitimately, which legitimately belonged to some, some other person. Similarly, these kind of parallels could be drawn that how colonial masters or the British, they were able to take the uh, or manage or control the Indian empire and which was not legitimate in nature. This is how uh, the mythologicals, they had these kind of undercurrents. And when Lord Krishna, he talks about bad, bad judgment or misrule or the operation or tyranny of his uncle, it was suggested, suggestive of colonial rule and oppression. So, we can say that mythologies or mythological stories, they were using metaphor and allegory. Allegory and metaphor, they were being used to uh, convey the kind of meanings which they wanted to convey to the audience. Some of the examples which I would like to point out, some of the films which were being made during that time and which talked about uh, that how these mythological films, they were able to reflect uh, some kind of certain social reality of those times. Sarandri was a film which was made in 1919, which exposed the regime of Lord Curzon. Lord Curzon, who was the Governor General of India or Viceroy, the kind of excesses which were being uh, committed during that time and the kind of authority which was exercised by the colonial masters during that period. That, was, that could be seen, some kind of parallels could be draw, drawn in this film. In Dharmatma, another film which was made in 1935, the Harijan problem was highlighted during that period. Gopal Krishna was another film which dealt with the rule of a despot. Gopal Krishna was based on the struggle between Lord Krishna and Kans and how Kans, who is a despot, uh, is able to usurp a kingdom which illegitimately he usurped. So, that is being shown in that film. Some of the saint poets like Sant Tukaram, Rajarani Meera, Chandidas, Sant Gyaneshwar, Bhakt Kabir. So, these were some of the films which were being made during that time in which the humanist and reformist approach could be very well seen. So, we see that a number of films they were being made which were mythological in nature during this particular period and it also created a certain kind of impact during that period. Because when uh, these kind of mythological films, they were being exhibited in the cinema halls, women of the family, they were being allowed by the elders of the family to go and see these mythological films. 
So, because they were considered to be devotional films, mythological films and they related with gods and goddesses. So, women they were being allowed to go out in the public sphere and in this way socialization of women also took place because when women they went to see films in theatres during that time. At the same time when these films were being shown a number of topicals or a small news reels they were also being uh, exhibited in the cinema halls in which various Indian National Congress leaders uh, they were also being shown and they were asking women to participate in the national movement. And when Indian National Congress leaders like sister Nivedita, Ini Besant, Sarojini Naidu, they moved in the public as representatives of their gender in the freedom struggle, social barriers they were also be a bit relaxed in the sense that the women those who were being allowed to go out in the public sphere and when they saw these women articulating their ideas and notions toward the national movement. And Gandhi at the same time also asked women to join in large numbers in 1920s, 30s and 1942 during Quit India movement. So, we see a large women participation in civil disobedience movement in 1930. Some of the important issues during the civil disobedience movement like picketing of liquor shops, picketing of foreign goods shops which were being undertaken bonfires of cloth they take place. So, we see a huge participation of women during that time and Gandhi he sa said that that the participation of women in these national movement was some kind of extension of their uh, role of their traditional role, the traditional role which, which they were following in their household. In the similar fashion when they were coming out at that time they were also uh, in a way extending their traditional role of uh, nurturing the family. So, when these kind of nationalist ideas they will be seen by the women, so naturally they will be debated at home and children naturally will also be affected by these developments because women they will be influenced by it. So, in that sense we can say that cinema had some kind of impact and this kind of impact could be very well seen in the various kind of researches we have. Cinema as a uh, source of history writing has been neglected for quite some time and the Indian historians they have not paid a lot of attention to cinema as a source of history writing and it was neglected in the academic discipline, it was at the periphery of the academic disciplines for quite some time. But in the last 10-15 years a lot of research has taken place in cinema studies and this research is trying to see that how cinema and society they are linked to each other and how during the phase of Indian national movement also cinema played an important role or how the celluloid projections they were in a way affected by the developments which were taking place in the political field. So, when we see the impact of cinema which was a new audio visual source of history writing that then we can say that now definitely some kind of research is being done in the various uh, 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 universities of our country in which some kind of importance is given to the cinema studies. Though we may not have cinema studies department in different parts of the universities in, in our country, they, they are very few, but now some kind of recognition is being given to this field of study which is new. Uh, in terms in terms of history writing. We see that the portrayal of nationalist aspirations and motives it took place in cinema at different times even in the films which were uh, not directly trying to be pro national. There were a number of uh, themes or a number of ideas which could be seen in these films and at the same time some of the congress leaders during that time they won they also tried to use cinema as in the election campaigns uh, in 1937 Satyamurti uh, in South India he tried to use cinema uh, so that uh, he could be able to influence the voters. And at the same time various films on Gandhi in terms of documentaries they were also being made during that particular period though they were being banned because of the censorship policy which was being followed by the British at that time. But these films definitely when they were seen later uh, they had a lot of impact on the masses. Apart from the mythological films 
we also see that some of the historicals and the biographicals they were also being made during this period. The historical films and the biographical films was another important genre uh, during uh, uh, the colonial rule. The background of the historical film it provided an opportunity to the director or the filmmaker to present the visual splendor and richness of the palatial forts, processions, costumes and the war scenes because historical films they were on a very grand scale on a large scale they were being made in which a lot of extravagance was being shown. But the basic problem of these films was that they were based on a subject matter of the important events of the past and they propagated anti-imperialist awareness that they lacked a modern historical approach. Because when these films they were presenting the events of the past, they were trying to project them in such a manner and that some kind of modern historical approach was lacking in them. Because they were relying on the grandeur or the splendor of the past and trying to project India as a country which had a rich, rich cultural heritage and now it was suffering because of the colonial rule. So, in that sense we can very well say these films they were backward looking and they were revivalist in nature. So, in that sense uh, they, this is one criticism of such kind of films. We can also say <coughs> that the so called historical films they were generally a mixture of fact and fiction. A historical event or a character it was chosen by the filmmaker and around which some of the stories certain fictitious characters certain fictitious events they were being added so that they could appeal to the masses. As we have already discussed that cinema or films was a, an economic enterprise and the filmmaker had to uh, get back the money which he had invested. So, in that sense uh, the films which will only talk about the historical events in a total accurate manner that became a casualty because the idea was to uh, get back the uh, get back the money which was being invested. So, in this way the historicals they were no, uh, they, they could not become uh, objective in that sense. Uh, there was some a lot, a lot of subjectivity in the historicals which were being made during this time. Udaykal was another film which was made in 1930 which was a historical film which was based on the life of a Maratha warrior Shivaji and it was a clever allegory on the overthrow of the foreign or colonial rule. This film was originally titled Swaraj Toran flag of freedom, but censors, censors they uh, censored it or they revised the content of the film and title also was changed so that it could suit the colonial regime. So, in this way the colonial censorship authority they were playing with any kind of themes, any kind of themes which are socio political in nature, which were political in nature, uh, the dialogues or maybe uh, the ideas which were democratic in nature, which were revolutionary in nature, they were being excised or deleted by the colonial masters or colonial censorship authorities. Another important historical film which was made in 1939 was Pukar and Pukar was an excellent dramatization some of the semi historical episodes in the life of the justice loving Mughal emperor Jahangir. A significant aspect which was woven into the film was the theme of Hindu Muslim unity. So, Pukar which was made in 1939 was made by Sohra Modi who made some other films like Prathivallav etcetera Sikandar which was also made in 1939. So, these were some of the films which were trying to explore the historical themes, but these historical themes they were presented in such a manner that some of the fictitious elements or characters they were being incorporated so that they appeal to the audience and that became some kind of a weakness of these films. It is we can also say and it was also known that uh, during the medieval Indian history period uh, uh, medieval India has been portrayed as a decadent and tyrannical by the colonial historiography. The colonial historians or the historiography they have portrayed or shown uh, the medieval Indian history as a decadent history which was tyrannical in nature. And when they came to India, when colonial rule came to India, they converted 
in, into some kind of benevolent rule. And so, their rule the white man's burden was to civilize the Indians and any kind of tyranny, any kind of decadence which was there during the, during the medieval times was corrected by the colonial rulers. And these films when the, these historicals they were being made, uh, they attempted to portray uh, the Mughal grandeur in such a manner that they are able to convey a message or they are able to locate the message that a pre-colonial secular pan-Indian nation state it existed in India during the medieval period. So, these films they also became sort of some sort of a critique of uh, the colonial rule and they wanted to project the Indian grandeur and they wanted to project India as a land in which there was a lot of prosperity and happiness because before the coming of the colonial rule or be before the coming of the British. And this is why these kind of films they were being made. Under Deshpande, he argues that the ideological instrumentality of the historical is an irrefutable fact, even though they might be called reactionary and backward, as they were rooted in oppressive and racial colonial rule. This is what he argues. Another important film about which I want to talk about is Sikandar, which was made in 1943. Sikandar was made by Sohrab Modi and this the release of the film when this film was released then World War II was also taking place. So, during that time when World War II it began in 1939 and it ended in 1945. So, during that period when the second world war it was being waged uh, between the different countries of the world this film was being released and Hitler had already invaded or engulfed much of the Europe during that time. And in India also there was a lot of political tension at that time, because British unilaterally they had declared that India was on their side, which was not liked by the Congress. And Congress argued that many of the uh, most of many of the, all the Congress ministries, they resigned during that time in the protest that uh, they were not in favor of the war and they were not collaborating or supporting British in their war efforts. And Mahatma Gandhi started uh, this uh, uh, the do or die battle which was the quit India movement during this period and which, which we very well see during this period. And when Sikandar it was being exhibited or shown in many of the cantonment areas during that period it was able to arouse the nationalist feelings or patriotic feelings among the masses. We see that when the soldiers in these areas when they saw this film and when Sikandar and Porus they were having some kind of conversation between them and the reply of Porus that he should be treated like a king, because Sikandar or Alexander himself was a king. So, he should treat him like another king and he gets very impressed with the bravery of Porus. So, these kind of in incidents which were being played in the film during this time, the soldiers of uh, uh, which were part of the British army during that time, uh, they were inspired by such kind of portrayals during that period and their national sentiments they also got aroused. When British authorities they saw that such kind of problems they were taking place, they were happening during that time. So, they claimed uh, a ban on the screening of this film in many of the cantonment areas. And when Porus he talked about the driving the aliens or from the Bharat Vars, it could be very well understood as a reference to the British, because the British they had illegally or illegitimately captured India. So, when Porus is talking about driving out the foreigners from India, so definite, definitely such kind of parallels could be drawn between them. At the same time, we see that a lot of changes which are taking place in the society during that time, the impact of the socialist revolution of 1917, 1917 in Russia, <coughs> the Indian communist movement which also began in 1920, the communist party of India was formed and various workers and the peasant movements which were being launched at different times that we can also very well see. And progressive cultural movements 
they were also being launched in the form of Progressive Writers Association, which was formed in 1936 under the presidentship of uh, Munshi Premchand and IPTA, Indian People's Theatres Association, which was also formed in 1943. So, these movements they helped in the direction of religious orthodoxy and establishment of new values and ideas in the socio-political sphere. The protests against the religious fanaticism, caste based divisions and violence against women were also a result of these influences in the cultural sphere. Various reform movements which began in 19th century, uh, uh, Brahmo Samaj, Arya Samaj, uh, uh, Swami Vivekananda, then all these movements it also had important role to play in transforming the Indian reality. And uh, the theme of the socials will take care of that when we will talk about social films of that period which were being influenced by uh, the uh, social religious reform movements of the 19th century which carried on till 20th century as well, which wanted to unite India any kind of disintegration should be avoided. Then the ideas of uh, Swami Vivekanand, Arya Samaj, then Gandhi, uh, Ambedkar, uh, Karve, all these people they also wanted to transform uh, uh, the Indian reality, the kind of changes they wanted to bring in India. Another important genre during this time was the commercial films which were based on the literary works. Many of uh, the literary figures uh, like Munshi Premchand, Bhagwati Charan Verma, Pandey Bechan Sharma Ogre, Amrit Lal Nagar, Govind Das, Sudarshan Seth, Sumitra Nandan Pant etc. They also got associated in some measure with films. It might have been the case for example, in the case of Munshi Premchand, he wrote a film script uh, which was titled Majdur or Mill and uh, a lot of changes were being made in the script which he wrote for the film with which he was not happy. And later he said also that he was not interested in this field though he went there for the money, but now it did not attract him because filmmakers they were only at, uh, uh, devoted uh, to money making enterprise and they were not uh, 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 involved in any other kind of literary activity. So, that might have been one of the cases, but there were many others those who got associated with the films and, though, and many others those who wrote a number of novels and stories and they, their stories and novels they were being used by the filmmakers uh, to present a particular kind of reality. For example, Rabin Nath Tagore, Bankim Chandra Chatterjee, Sarat Chandra in Bengali, N. H. Apte, Mama Varerkar, V. S. Khandekar, P. K. Atre in Marathi and K. M. Munshi and Raman Lal Desai in Gujarati they contributed at some of the important stories on which a number of films they were being made. The stories of Sarash Chandra Chatterjee, for example, Dev Pauna, Devdas, Manzil or Grehda, Badi Didi, Kashinath, Chota Bhai. So, these were some of the important cinematic uh, or the best cinematic material which was available to the people of those times on which a number of films they were being made. Some of the other films of uh, that period which were uh, some based on the literary works was Charitrahin of Dhirendra Ganguly which was based on the novel of Sarat Chandra. Then Madhu Bose Giribala which was based on the novel which was written by Rabindranath Tagore. Whose Fault was another film which was based on K. Munshi's novel Hell's Paradise or Gori Bala was based on the story of Mama Varerkar and V. Shantaram's Amrit Manthan was based on N. H. Apte's story. Some other films which were based on these literary works was Hamlet of Sohra Modi which was based on the Shakespearean drama of the same name. Then Vinayak and Baburao Pandharkar's Chaya was based on the story of V. S. Khandekar, Dr. Madhurika which was based on the story of K. M. Munshi and another important film of that time V. Shantaram's Dunya Namane which was based on N. H. Apte's story. Dunya Namane was a film <coughs> which was against the mismatched marriages and this film was very revolutionary in the nature in the sense that it was way ahead of its time. The kind of treatment, the kind of lightening, the kind of direction of this film was way ahead of 
it, its times and the kind of theme also which was talking about mismatched marriages in which elder men they were marrying younger women which was one of the social evils of uh, that times. Then some of the other films which were being based on the literary themes was Prakash Purnima which was based on a Gujarati novel. Then Dunia Kya Hai which was based on a novel uh, written by Tolstoy. Resurrection, Badi Didi of Amar Malik which was based on Sarachand's story. Then Fani Majumdar's Kapal Kundal which was also based on uh, uh, a novel which was written by Ban Kim Chandra. So, these were some of the films which were being made uh, for example, Sohra Modi's Prathivallab based on the novel of K. Munshi, then Sabbesachi which was again based on Sarachand's novel. So, that way we can say that a number of stories, novels, literature that was being used to make films. So, the connection between literature and cinema can be very well seen that how literature was being used to make films and how literature became some kind of important handwork uh, in the making of films. Apart from these films another important category of films which were being made during this time was the stunt films. Stunt films uh, two important figures of the stunt films were Vadia and Nadia. Vadia, J B H Vadia and Humi Vadia they were the brothers those who were the producers those who made a number of stunt films. In Nadia who was known as the Nadia Hunter Wali who's, who was a foreigner uh, Mary Evans and she was an important figure uh, in the genre of the stunt films. And the various titles of the stunt films uh, these films they were very provocative in nature and the kind of titles they had uh, they teased uh, the British in some measure and it also conveyed some kind of a patriotic fervor in them. For example, uh, uh, the films titled like Azadi, Hind Kesari, Desh Deepak, Desh Dasi, Nav Bharat, Veer Bharat, Jawar -e Hind all these films Baghi Sipahi, Swaraj Ka Sipahi the, the kind of titles these films had they, they were in a way trying to suggest to the British that we will make such kind of films which may not be like, like likeable to the colonial masters. And a number of banners the kind of banners the titles of the banners which were uh, being uh, made by these filmmakers they were also against uh, the kind of policies which were being uh, framed by the British for example, Jawahar pictures uh, which was being established national movie tone. Hindamata films, Indian Liberty. So, these were the titles of various studios uh, which were being established during the colonial rule. And when we see the stunt films, we see that a number of overtones which were nationalist in nature, which were patriotic in nature, which were advocating democracy, which were against which was against colonial rule. So, these were some of the, uh, the undercurrents which we see in the films of these times. And when we see the climax scenes in the stunt films of this particular period, we see that the uh, some kind of confrontation verbal confrontation is there between the protagonist and the antagonist in which the people's right of democracy, good governance, justice freedom of speech and expression they are being advocated and uh, the protagonist is generally clad or semi clad in tattered cloth and uh, who, who is able to fight with the British because of his self confidence and might. And the British on the other hand they are seen to be or shown to be exhibited in that manner that they are the ruling elite. So, even when there were stories of kings and queens then kings and queens and their rule is being usurped by some other person. So, that usurper was generally seen in the form of the British. So, these were the stories around which uh, the stunt films they were able to convey the message of patriotism convey some kind of national consciousness advocated the idea of democracy advocated the idea of some kind of revolutionary revolutionarism. So, and in the end we see that the victory of good over evil takes place and the legitimate rule is established and the Ill illegitimate has to give way to the legitimate. 
K. Bas, who is, uh, as I have talked about, was one of the important journalist, important journalists and filmmakers who was associated with IPTA, Indian People's Theatres Association, as well. And uh, he observed that in the atmosphere of the growing anti-imperialism, even the stunt films, which were coarse in nature, which were crude in nature, they were used to portray and glorify the democratic aspirations of the masses. So, stunt films, they were using metaphor, they were, they were using allegory, so that these ideas, they reach the masses. And if the British censors, they were satisfi satisfied or they were appeased at the climax of the film, in which the legitimate heir on the throne is being installed, the uh, audience of the film, it could not forget the earlier sequences in which the how the people they defy the authority of a tyrant, how the people they voice their aspirations against the tyrant, how the people they get together and they clamor and they fight for the rights of the protagonist or the authority of the protagonist which has been illegitimately taken over by the colonial masters. At the same time, we should also keep this thing in mind that these kind of films uh, this kind of rhetoric was not coincidence, because it was being done deliberately. J. B. H. Wadia, who was associated with the Indian National Congress, and he was also associated uh, with the Communist Party of India. And later, he recollects that how he tried to weave these kind of stories uh, in his films, so that people they get such kind of messages. So, as a political uh, activist also, he was trying to provide these kind of messages to the masses and the elections of 1935, uh, uh, the elections of 1937 which were scheduled under the act of 1935, they were also to be held and these films, they wanted to empower the masses in that sense. And as I have already said that J. B. H. Wadia, he agreed that these kind of, uh, 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 these kind of uh, insertions, they were deliberate in nature and he thought out uh, these uh, insertions in a planned manner, so that the ideas of democracy and freedom, they reach the masses. And at the same time, he also suggests that some of the essential uh, themes of his films were untouchability, literacy, campaigns and the dignity of labor. And he also wanted the people to be against anti-fascism and to be in favor of democracy and how the emancipation of Indian women that should take place. Apart from these films, there was another genre uh, which was, uh, which could be seen even now, which was a genre of cheap and obscene commercial films. Cheap and obscene commercial films, they were also being made during this period in which we find a lot of nudity and obscenity. And many of the times, this kind of nudity and obscenity was not objected by the colonial censors, because they were not concerned with these kind of themes. They were only concerned about the uh, political or reactionary themes, and that is why they did not interfere in such kind of themes, which were being uh, uh, shown to the Indian audience. And many of the films initially were the American and the European films, which were being imported to India and which were being uh, 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 exhibited in India without any censor. Because till 1918, we did not have any uh, cinemat cinematograph act and no rules and regulations regarding the censoring of the films. And these kind of cheap and obscene commercial films, it caused a lot of concern among the masses. And even in the legislative assembly, some of the legislative members, legislative council, the kind of uh, 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 the kind of bad impact these films, they will convey to the audience that was being discussed. In the legislative assembly debate on 21st March 1927, one of the members, he argued that uh, these kind of uh, uh, films, it will try to in a way corrupt uh, the morals of the masses. In the similar vein, R. P. Karandikar in the Council of State, uh, he suggested that it will take the people or the students away uh, from uh, the kind of uh, rightful presentations which should be given to them. Some of the magazines like Abhidya and Film India, they attacked this kind of mentality 
of the masses and that is why we see that they attack the get rich quick mentality of the people and why these kind of films they were being made. So, uh, these were some of the uh, genres we have talked about other genres we will talk in our next program some of the genres have been left left like socials etc censorship censorship authority of the British which we will take up in our next program. Okay, so well friends with this word we conclude the lecture. I thank all of you for watching the lecture and on behalf I thank uh, Professor Manoj Sarma for giving such a wonderful thank lecture. You. Thank you very much.